Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of Sidetracked. Uh, this is going to be basically a talk show about music. We want to kind of focus on, you know, making a platform for people to have, you know, discussions about music and to promote sort of a local music scene in Warrensburg. And so to do so, we want to bring bands on and kind of have them play. But before we get into that stuff, we felt like we needed to introduce ourselves not just in the traditional sense, but also in sort of our musical tastes. So, Leah, you want to start introducing yourself? Yeah, so um, I'm a, obviously, since we're doing this, it's pretty safe to say that I'm a huge fan of music, and I absolutely love it. It's a big part of my life. Um, I think that it's pretty safe to say that my life kind of revolves around it, no matter whether I'm uh, driving, cooking, cleaning, uh, sometimes even in class. I'm listening mm -hmm. to music all the time. Um, I, can pin it, I can take it back to a specific point when I was a kid when my dad was telling me about how he was a bouncer for concerts back in the day, and I just remember him telling me all these crazy stories, and I remember thinking, I'm, I'm going to be one of those people that like does crazy stuff at concerts, and I think that that was like a big trigger for me. Mm -hmm. um, I listened to a lot of... Um, newer alternative stuff. I like a lot of old metal, um, Megadeth, Iron Maiden, Metallica. That's kind of my stuff. Um, huge Led Zeppelin fan. And my uh, secret uh, love is old, old country. <laughs> I don't <laughs> tell too many people that. Um, but yeah, music's more than just noise coming out of boxes for me. I feel like yeah. I'm a character in a movie sometimes. And uh, the music I listen to is kind of my soundtrack. Dude, so. that's dope. <laughs> I, like, think about that way too much also. Yeah, when you're walking in class and stuff, oh, like, yeah. oh, this is my jam. Yeah, throw on some, like, Wu-Tang, and I'm walking along, <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, so, for me, I listen to, I guess, more, um, I listen to a more, like, indie, sort of, hipster, noise rock stuff, more so than uh, sort of the classic rock and metal stuff that Leah listens to. Um, and I also listen to a lot of, a lot of hip-hop. I'm very very entrenched in my hip-hop opinions uh and i think for me music kind of comes back to uh my brother my siblings are all a lot older than me but uh i remember in i was in like sixth grade and my brother gave me a motion city soundtrack uh cd and was like hey listen to this and i was like okay and i did and then i think i listened to that I'm, it must have been 150 200 times during my like sixth sixth grade year, and uh, I don't know. I feel like from there I started to delve into music because before that it was just whatever my parents had on or whatever my siblings had Which on. Which can be or, dangerous sometimes. Yeah, oh, it can be real bad. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely. I think that's like a really important moment. And then there's a few other times where, like, I remember the first time I heard the Mountain Goats was like this huge thing for me. Like that completely changed me. And I don't know. There's a. I I think it's really important to recognize like these songs that do have an impact on you. Because, you know, it's like any other. You watch a movie, you come out of it, you're changed somehow, mm -hmm. you know. It might be, like, microscopic, but it, it did, everything has an impact on you. So uh, that's kind of, I guess that's kind of where I'm at. Um, so now that we've got our introductions out of the way, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break. All right, guys, welcome back to Sidetracked. Now we're going to move into... Uh, not necessarily like the critics or the, the popular choice of what the best albums are, but individually, for me and Leo, what we think the top five albums, respectively, of 2016 were. So we're going to start with mine. Uh, my, f my number five record is Stage 4 by Touche Amore. And these guys are, see, I'm horrible with my, like, random genres. I mm -hmm. think post-hardcore is the, the name of their genre. Um, screamo is probably would most people recognize it as. And this is not a genre that I normally listen to, really, but um, this record is just so raw and emotional, and um, it's a, basically a concept album dealing with the singer's, the, his mother's passing uh, of cancer. And so sort of the struggle of her dealing with that and dealing with the, with the treatments and stuff in life, and then ultimately her death and, and dealing with that. Uh, so it's a very emotional record, very sad, very raw. Um, my only... On, honestly, my only complaint is, as somebody who likes uh, like really noisy lo-fi stuff, I wish they had actually just amped this up and made it just a little bit more raw and and hard to deal with. Because I mean, that's what cancer is, you know. Uh, so, Leo, you listen to the to the album. Yeah, yeah, I liked it. This is actually kind of the stuff that uh, my little brother and my older brother and stuff listen to. My family kind of jams to this kind of stuff. So, I was definitely into this album. Mm. Don't have too many 
critical comments yeah. about it. But. Oh, I do want to circle back around to, so I've got my top tracks listed here. Um, the second track on the album, New Halloween, and I believe Rapture's the third. Uh, the album's just, it starts off. So the first, the first song, um, I, I just love the songwriting all over. I was just about to say I love the writing in the first song, and then I realized, no, I just love the writing all over it. It's... It's all beautiful. Um, well, there's, there's like one, a good meaning behind it also. Yeah, I mean, it's, it makes it it's e yeah. not easier, but makes it deeper. Yeah, there's like a, there's a line. So New Halloween is basically like it's been a year since since she's passed away and he's kind of dealing with that and dealing with the uh, like the anniversary of her death and uh, Rapture. The, the hook on that song, the I always saw the glasses being half full. Like, oh, man, it's. All the writing in this. Yes. I was like, third song in, I'm already almost in tears. Like, really beautiful album. Like I said, it's it's post-hardcore. It's It can be inaccessible, but definitely worth a listen. Well, my top five was Death of a Bachelor by Panic at the Disco. Um, I think that Panic at the Disco definitely was, like, kind of a face for a lot of our generation's... Um, uh, a lot of our generation's emo phase. I know a lot of us, like, I know oh, I definitely sure. went through an emo phase where I, w I had, like, I had dyed my hair black and I always did black nail polish and wore uh, band t-shirts all the time. Oh, it yeah. really grew out of that. <laughs> Actually, it didn't really grow out of all of that. But uh, um, I think that, like, the evolution of Panic! The Disco has been super duper fun to watch mm -hmm. because from their early stuff, when you listen to it, it's like, like this is all good music, but it just gets so much better, and it's so much, it's such a better, much, it's a much better quality. Um, and then in a uh, in an interview, Brandon Yuri actually says that he channeled his inner Sinatra, and I mean you can definitely see that when yeah. you listen to this whole album. Um, my top two tracks from this were "Impossible Year" and "Don't Threaten Me with a Good Time," which are like on the spectrum of like emotional, like how you feel when you listen to them. They're on the opposite ends because mm -hmm. "Impossible Year" is like slow and it's really sad and then don't threaten me with a good time is about a good time and about partying and being with your friends and doing crazy stuff so i thought it had everything for yeah. me anyways everything i was looking for yeah oh yeah um i gotta say i'm surprised not to see la devotee in your top tracks because that really is like that song far and away <laughs> my favorite my favorite song on the record i really dig that track um yeah and, and you like you were saying about the the evolution of the the band this record sounds like nothing like yeah. I don't know it's 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 definitely been a wild ride mm -hmm. um, uh, so my number four I guess we'll move on is uh, Run the Jewels 3 and this album was actually slated for a 2017 release it it barely squeaked in but uh, god I'm glad that they did because this thing is amazing uh, and like a Christmas Eve yeah exactly it was <laughs> like, like a Christmas present and then they, they did the Portlandia skit where they announced it and oh it was so good um, but this thing is full of I mean it's if you listen to Run the Jewels 1 if you listen to Run, Run the Jewels 2 like it's more of the same but it just feels more polished and actually this record feels more political and that's coming from their second album had a line on it something to the effect of um and the forehead engravers and slavers of men and women, and uh, and something about religion, the people who rule over you through religion. So this is coming from people who made a record like that, and this is more political, more of that um, sort of like rap with a message. And I feel like that's kind of what hip hop to me is is about having this message and about dealing with um, you know the problems that plague a community, and so. Uh, that's why I put a report to the shareholders, because it's that that is a feels to me like a call to action, like a kill your masters, let's destroy the government and start yeah. over. Like, oh, it's so this thing is crazy. <laughs> I think that this is one of the best album cover arts that we have in the throughout the entire show. I think that this yeah. is one of my favorites. Yeah, and then there's also that because there's also there's a song on the record, "Stay Gold." And so they've got that coming up a few mm -hmm. times, the the gold theme, and you know, dude, Killer Mike and LP, dude. man, you can't go wrong with them. When even Kendrick is talking about them, <laughs> like, you, that's how you know somebody's good. All right. Awesome. Well, my number four, um, going back to Black Star and David Bowie, 
this album was flabbergasting. <laughs> I oh, will yeah. just go ahead and say it was flabbergasting, I think. Um, obviously, Bowie's like a huge music icon. He has been forever. And this album gave all of his fans like at least somewhat closure about what was going on and what happened. And I remember when I heard the news and when I listened to the album, like I just couldn't help but tear up. And I like I get really emotional and invested in my favorite artists and stuff. And I think it's really noble that he was working on this up until his death. Like yeah. there was, I mean, he just put everything he had into this album. Um, one of my Lazarus is my favorite song from this album specifically because. Um, in the song, it says, oh, I'll be free, just like that bluebird. And if that doesn't make you, like, I don't know, if that doesn't make your heart hurt, then I don't know what does. Yeah. <laughs> but there's definitely an emotional attachment for me and probably for every other Bowie fan in the entire world with yeah. this album. Um, and then Tis a Pity She Was a Whore is just a great song. I yeah. really like that. was my second favorite yeah. one on the album. No, I, this record, I, I li- the first time I listened to it, it was like two in the morning. I was by myself in my room. Not I was a like, because I knew. <laughs> well, see, I knew that I was gonna be, because I've listened to Bowie forever. Mm-hmm. I mean, I grew up with him, and so I knew I was gonna be very emotional about it. And so I locked myself away, and I knew it was gonna be sad. But there was almost this like air of like like creepiness to it, of like, you know, it it really it delves into dying and leaving a legacy, and it made me think not just about his death, which is what I was going and expecting, but also, you know, worrying about my own. And mm-hmm. uh, I had nightmares for like weeks after listening to this thing. It was, it messed me up, <laughs> but <laughs> it was, it was an amazing ride. It's an amazing album. It's some of his best night stuff, I think. Absolutely. All right. So for me, my next record is, we're on number two. Oh. Three. Three. Okay. I was like, oh man, I'm getting ahead of myself. I was about to say, no, oh, I don't want to give it away. All right. <laughs> we're on my number three is Blonde by Frank Ocean. And this record, see, I'm going to be honest, I wasn't a huge fan of Channel Orange. Um, I thought that it was, I liked a lot of what was going on. I felt it was kind of almost a little immature. Like it wasn't really, you know, the best that he could be doing. And man, did he bring the best that he could be doing this record. He really brought it around and he delivered. Uh, this thing is, it's soulful. Um, it's the songwriting, once again, that's, if you can't tell, that's an, a very important thing for me is when, I, when I'm looking at, you know, the lyrics to a song, what am I seeing? And he delivers, like Solo, one of my top tracks. Um, there's a bull and a matador dueling in the sky. Uh, in hell and hell there's heaven. Like that's, uh, that hook is fantastic. And then all of all of Nike's, like the reference to Othello. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I could gush on this record forever, but it's it's instrumentally it's great. It's got that soul sound, and the writing is just fantastic. Absolutely. Very mature record. My number three album was Walls by Kings of Leon. Um, I it's funny now when I look back at it because I. When I first heard Kings of Leon, and I think I was in middle school whenever I first heard some of their stuff, and I did not like it. I was like, this sounds weird. I'm not a fan. And now, like, that's really funny to me because I Kings of Leon is actually one of my new favorite bands. Um, and it took me a long time to get around to listening to this Milky, <laughs> Milky <laughs> album. Uh, but once I did, I was super duper pleased with it, and I thought it was absolutely awesome. Some of the stuff that I've read about it, though, is a lot of critics and reviewers didn't like it just because it wasn't as rugged and rough as their, mm. as their past stuff. I can see that. Um, I can see that, but I definitely like this sound better. Really? Um, yeah, I think middle school me would have liked it a lot better, too. Yeah. Um, but this album really made me want to see them in concert because... I mean, concert tickets are expensive, and you can only go see so many bands, and I think it's really important whenever they release an album like this, and it makes people want to go see them, because that's really where their money is anyways. Mm -hmm. But my definite top two tracks were Around the World and Walls. Um, Around the World is um, super duper cool, because I like to travel, and I think, like, every time I listen, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm traveling around the world. (laughs) But Yeah. Uh, I've got to say, before we move on to mine, I really like the song Reverend. I think that's my that's favorite a good song. On, the, on the record. They're all good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I definitely enjoyed the whole thing, but that yeah. second song. Mm. Uh, so my number two, moving right along, is Teens of Denial by Car Seat Headrest. And this is a band that, once again, like, like I said with Frank Ocean, you know, um, I wasn't, you know, all that impressed with their record before. The few things I'd heard from it, it, it felt like they kind of dragged on, like they weren't 
operating on full all their cylinders, I guess. Uh, but man, you you can ask Leah. We we've talked about this record ad nauseum. But uh, it's got that lo-fi sound that I love. It's it's youthful. It's rebellious. It's um, it deals with a lot of like issues that I think you know are especially like prevalent to our age group like the song Destroyed by Hippie Powers and then the song on the record that follows it, Drugs with Friends, they, at first, it, they remind me of Swimming Pools by Kendrick Lamar where they, they sound like they're an anthem, like endorsing uh, drug use or drinking, but in reality, they're kind of talking about how people feel pressured to do so uh, at, in this age group and because of the scene they're in. And so I just think there's a, another, another example of amazing songwriting. He's an English major, you can tell. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the whole thing is amazing. So that's my number two, Leah, you ready to? Yeah, um, my number two was actually almost my number one. It's Cleopatra by by the Lumineers. And it, um, I had been waiting for so long, I mean, not really that long, I guess, but I've been waiting for a long time to hear their, like their comeback album. And I think that they did a great job of uh, sticking to what they were good at. Like I said with, like we said that with Panic of the Disco, they really evolved over time. And Cleopatra definitely did not show that with the Lumineers. They kind of stuck with what they were good at. They, um, I don't know. I didn't see too much of a change, but I liked it. They know what they're, they know what works. They stuck with it. And I think that's great. Um, every time I listen to any of the Lumineers songs, no matter which album, um, it's, there is, um, I feel like there's like a feel where I'm sitting in an old bar drinking like a craft beer, and I think that's one of the coolest things ever. <laughs> um, my top two tracks were Angela and Where the Skies Are Blue, and both of those songs are songs I can just listen to over and over again. I really like it a lot. Mm. And like we talked about before, you didn't even put White Lie on there, which I know. <laughs> is my favorite song on the record, but it's Number fine. Three. It's fine. <laughs> uh, so finally, the big reveal, my number one which is going to surprise exactly no one ever uh, who knows me, but 22 A Million by Bon Iver. Um, you know, we keep talking about the evolution of an artist, and I think that uh, Bon Iver, more so than most other artists, like each of his, ju it's Justin Vernon, each of his records feel uh, vastly different from each other. They have this sort of um, difference in theme. They're not quite concept albums, but they, they have a location or a theme or an idea in mind, and they run with it. And this one, the idea that it runs with is almost feels like not having an idea. It's, it feels like being lost as an artist and not knowing um, what message you're trying to convey, what you need to be doing, not wanting to be stuck releasing the same record every year, but instead trying to challenge yourself and finding that you know maybe you can't find yourself and maybe you can't find the sound that you need to be having. And that's especially what God is to me using religion as a as a focus for that. Uh, so yeah, I think this record's great. I think that the instrumentals and the lyrics, the lyrics are almost meaningless, but in a way that you can find any number of meanings in them. And I think that's really cool. And that's kind of why it's my top, because I can listen to this thing 400 times and still have no idea what's going on, <laughs> but always wanting to keep figuring it out. It's not like, I don't know, I don't want to know. Yeah. So my number one album of 2016 has to be How to Be a Human Being by Glass Animals. Um, this song, or this album, uh, gave me a completely different perspective on pineapples, and that's the only reason <laughs> that I like it. Just kidding, kind of. Um, I think that Glass Animals is definitely an upcoming band that is, they have to be respected for what, like, for what they are, but more so just, like, everything that they create, I think it's just beautiful art. Um, I don't think I've ever listened to a Glass Animals song and been like, you know, that was okay. It's always, that was awesome, and I'm going to listen to it 8,000 times. Yeah. Um, my top tracks on it were definitely Agnes and Pork Soda. Agnes is one of my favorite songs in the entire world right now just because it's about, um, it's about suicide, and it's about someone who actually committed suicide, and the lyrics are so strong, and you don't realize it until you listen to it a couple times. You're like, well, this is a really deep song, mm -hmm. but I, you just, I fell in love with it, like, the first time I listened to it. Yeah. And then Pork Soda, obviously, that gets a lot of hype anyways, but, yeah. I mean, Pineapples are in my head. That <laughs> song, like, the story behind the song, too, where they heard the someone, guy. yeah, the homeless yeah. guy saying that. It's just awesome. Yeah. I but, would... yeah, I definitely think that the album is captivating, and um, I, would, I would say that How to Be a Human Being is better than Zabba, but I think they still stay true to who they are, and it's still, 
it's, I don't know, it's still glass animals, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when I think of, oh, there's one word to describe this album, I immediately think, you know, this is pretty whimsical. Like, I feel whimsical <laughs> when I listen to it. And I think it's just a really good album that mm -hmm. makes me happy listening to it. Yeah. I really dig Agnes. I think that mm -hmm. song's great. I also really like um, Season 2, Episode 3. Yeah. Also love that title yeah that is like a fantastic song title and i don't know why it works so well it just does well because it's i don't know it's just awesome that it's like their second album and it's the third song on yeah. their second album so it's yeah. like oh everything just flows it's perfect yeah. but yeah i really like this thing i think that it flows especially well like each mm -hmm. song kind of moves into the next in a very absolutely mm -hmm. pineapple <laughs> so i think i think that covers it you know i think you you guys get sort of a sense of uh, maybe who we are as music listeners from this, and um, ideally that'll like inform whether or not you think maybe our opinions are worth listening mm -hmm. to as we bring other people on and as we do more reviews. Um, but we're gonna cut to a commercial break and then we'll come back and talk about kind of our plans for the future. All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, so we're gonna talk now about kind of what you can expect moving forward. Uh, so this week we talked about a bunch of albums. Our ideal, though, is to kind of focus on one album and pick um, one thing to to kind of really dissect and break into as much as we want to, and not go over time. <laughs> um, so that'll that's what to expect next week. We're also going to be bringing local musicians on, and for our first performance, we're going to have our friends uh, in the band Eggs on Mars come in. We're going to talk to them, interview them, figure out how they got started, what their goals are, what their influences are, and then ultimately have them, you know, play a set for us. Yep. So don't yeah. forget to follow us on Spotify, where we're going to put all of our top tracks from our albums on our onto a playlist. Um, each week we'll do this, and then we just like to give a special thanks out to Shannon Johnson and of course the UCM Communication Department for letting us do this and for helping us out so much with everything. Oh, of course, not have done it without you guys. Mm -hmm. 